time. Thank you all for coming. I'm David Wessel. Um, I'm new here at Brookings. I'm the director of the new center, Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to be here at this event uh, celebrating Eshwar Prasad's new book, The Dollar Trap. Uh, one of the cool things about being a journalist, which I was till about two weeks ago, is that you get the, you get the paperback version in advance, the, the galleys. Uh, so you get to read it before other people do. And I was, um, I immediately recommended it to all my colleagues because in addition to being wise, it explains things very clearly. And it's sometimes hard to explain to people the international financial system, even in a complicated way. It's really hard to explain it clearly. Eshwar told me that that's one of the benefits of teaching undergraduates. Um, the, 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 the big question, of course, that the book deals with is, given that the United States seems determined to demonstrate that we don't know how to run a financial system, we have a democracy that's dysfunctional, and we're living beyond our means, why in God's name does the rest of the world have so much appetite for US dollars? Uh, and that seems to be like a good question, and hopefully you'll get an answer today. Um, uh, so Eshwar will start. Eshwar, is, of course, is uh, here at Brookings as well as at Cornell University. And we're very lucky to have three panelists here. Charles Collins, uh, formerly of the US Treasury and the IMF, who is now Managing Director and Chief Economist of the Institute for International Finance, which is a collection of global financial institutions. Luis Moreno, who is the president of the Inter-American Development Bank and former ambassador from Colombia to the United States. And then uh, uh, Jose de Gregorio, a professor at the University of Chile, who is, was the former central banker of Chile, who uh, very uh, nicely uh, agreed to come at the last minute because, uh, uh, in, how do you say her name? Sri? <laughs> Sir Mugliani. Mugliani from the World Bank is unfortunately suffering from that cold that's going around Washington. Uh, so the order of business is very simple. Eshwar will speak for about 10 minutes. Each of my uh, uh, discussants will speak for about eight minutes. We'll have a little interchange, and then we'll have, have time for questions. I, I would, as always, uh, ask you to put your cell phones on silent or vibrate so we're not interrupted. And with that, Eshwar, take it away. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to have you as a colleague rather than on the other side of the fence. And it's a great honor to be part of such a distinguished uh, panel. Consider this. Um, the US was at the center of the global financial crisis. And since the crisis, the Federal Reserve has unleashed vast torrents of US dollars into the global financial system. The amount of net US public debt that is excluding the amount of debt that is held by the Social Security Trust Funds and the Federal Reserve, has risen by about $5.5 trillion between 2007 and 2013. And who's been buying up a lot of this debt? It turns out that about 3.3 trillion, or about 60% of this new debt, was in fact acquired by international investors. And although the US has been at the center of many of these troubles, and despite all the easy money policies. In fact, on a trade-weighted basis, the dollar is pretty much where it is today as it was right before the financial crisis. Now consider this. In October of 2013, there was a small probability, admittedly a small one, but when Ted Cruz was commandeering the Senate floor, and especially when he got to the part where he was reading aloud green eggs and ham, there was a non-zero probability that the US might actually default on its debt, perhaps for a short period, perhaps it's a technical default. Anytime a country has faced such a prospect of default on its debt, what has happened in the past? Money has flown from the country, the currency has depreciated, and yields on the bonds have risen. What happened in the US? From early September until mid-October, uh, 10-year bond yields actually fell by about 30 basis points. The US dollar stayed flat. Now, these are not isolated episodes. It turns out that ever since the financial crisis, time and again, anytime there is financial turmoil anywhere in the world, including in the US itself, money tends to come to the US in search of a safe haven. So what is going on here? Why is it that the world seems to be so enamored of the dollar? Now, in economics, when I teach my undergraduates, it always helps to come back to supply and demand. Uh, 
And that's a large part of the story. If one thinks about what happened after the financial crisis, the demand for financial safe assets has increased a lot. What are financial safe assets? These are typically assets that are considered to be relatively safe in terms of their principle and that are fairly liquid, that is easy to trade. And typically, government bonds of the major advanced economies that are traded in hard currencies tend to be viewed as financial safe assets. So what happened after the financial crisis, of course, is that many emerging markets that had viewed themselves as having large amounts of financial uh, protection in terms of foreign currency reserves suddenly started feeling that maybe they should have even more. And of course, this goes back to the post-Asian financial crisis period, after which many emerging markets, especially those in Asia, decided they wanted much more self-insurance or protection from volatile capital flows. So since 2000, emerging markets as a group have accumulated about $6.5 trillion worth of foreign exchange reserves. About half of that is China, the rest is the rest of the world, the rest of the emerging markets. And reserve accumulation has continued apace since the financial crisis. So emerging markets want more protection because their financial accounts are more open and they are much more susceptible to volatile capital flows. In addition, private investors want a lot more protection, especially in times of global financial turmoil. But while the demand has been rising, the supply has, if anything, been shrinking. Private sector, sector securities, by and large, are not seen as safe anymore. If you think about the Eurozone, the safe part of the Eurozone is really much smaller than the entire Eurozone debt. And countries like Japan and Switzerland, traditionally seen as safe havens, are in fact themselves accumulating reserves because they don't want their currencies to appreciate. So rather than supplying safe assets to the world, on net, they're demanding safe assets. So by default, the main provider of financial safe assets, especially thanks to all the public debt that is being issued here, is the US. Now, there are a variety of paradoxes here if you start looking into this more carefully. First of all, one of the reasons why emerging markets see much more capital flow volatility is, they might argue, the actions of the Fed. When the Fed unleashes um, loose money policies, money flows to the emerging markets. When there is a hint of a taper, then emerging markets find money flowing out. But all of this causes emerging markets to want more protection. And where do they come for protection? To the US. If you think about the dollar over the long term, it is quite likely, and the economists think it should happen, that the dollar will decline in value because this is necessary for the US trade deficit to decline. In fact, even though the dollar has remained relatively flat in the period since the financial crisis, in the decade prior, the dollar was in fact depreciating by about 1% a year. And if financial markets stabilize, this is likely to happen again. So we're faced with a situation where the, where the rest of the world is willing to pay an enormous amount for its protection. Not only are they willing to accept very low yields on US Treasury securities, but they're willing to accept the prospect of a declining um, value in terms of the domestic currency of their US Treasury security holdings. Now, in thinking about the dollar's role, it's important to distinguish among the different types of roles it plays in international finance. I have little doubt that the dollar's roles as a medium of exchange and as a unit of account will decline. Countries like China, Japan, and Korea now have currency packs that allow them to trade in each other's currencies directly without using the dollar as a vehicle currency. Commodities like oil have traditionally been priced and traded exclusively in dollars. There's no good reason for that to happen. And if you start thinking about electronic currencies, such as the Bitcoin, I don't think they're necessarily the wave of the future, but they do point to one aspect of the wave of the future, which is that trading costs and currencies are going to decline, and there is no real need for, a do for the dollar to remain the dominant unit of account or medium of exchange. But it's as a store of value that the dollar remains predominant. Now, why, as David pointed out, should the world trust a country where the politics seems to be messed up where the debt levels are rising, where monetary policy seems to be running on fumes. And here I argue that in addition to problems with the international monetary system, which I will come to in a second, 
the US has put together a magic combination which is going to be very difficult for any other country in the world to match. It's not just size, it's not just depth and liquidity of financial markets, but also a very robust set of public institutions and political institutions, including a trusted central bank, and also an open and democratic system of government. Why is this important? I mentioned that of the $10 trillion of net debt that the US has, foreign investors hold about $5.5 trillion. Now, the other $4.5 trillion is held domestically. And who holds treasury securities? It turns out to be largely pensioners who happen to live, a large number of them, in swing states like Florida. It's insurance funds. It's state and local governments. And these are all politically very powerful. So from the foreign investor's point of view, looking into the US, it seems like a rational proposition to say that the US would never use a strategy of using default to reduce the real value of its debt because there would be enormous political consequences to pay. If one thinks about a currency like the renminbi as an alternative, I have no doubt that the renminbi is gaining traction. Indeed, it is not just as an, an international currency, but also as a reserve currency. Some uh, central banks, including those of uh, uh, Jose's, the Chilean central bank, are already holding a small proportion of their international reserves in renminbi. But is it likely that the renminbi and China will be seen as a safe haven? Again, my sense is that given the nature of political and legal institutions there, foreign investors are unlikely to trust China as a safe haven. Indeed, all the evidence suggests that the Chinese themselves don't trust China. So it's hard to see international investors seeing China as a safe haven. So I have no doubt that the renminbi is going to become a viable, important reserve currency, but it's not going to threaten the dollar's role. So where does this leave us in terms of how things should be fixed in the international monetary system and whether this is good? If we were to get away from this, I think we would really need to fix two things in the uh, international monetary system. One, we need to think about the fact that a large number of economies, not just advanced economies, but also emerging market economies are relying on monetary policy as the first and last line of defense. If you think about the US, we have it exactly backwards on fiscal policy with a lot of short-term fiscal contraction when the recovery is still not in good shape and very little action in terms of dealing with long-term fiscal problems. If one looks at an emerging market economy like India, the uh, Reserve Bank of India, the central bank there, <clears throat> is being asked to support growth, maintain low inflation, maintain the value of the currency, and do much more. And of course, other advanced economy central banks like the BOJ, um, the ECB, and many others are all essentially the main drivers of policy within their countries. And monetary policy has spillovers. And these spillovers are very large in a financially integrated world economy, and these are likely to increase. So with these spillovers and with financial um, uh, consequences of these monetary policy actions, I think we will see emerging markets looking for more protection. An alternative to the sort of protection emerging markets need might be, rather than them relying on self-insurance through reserve accumulation, perhaps to have some sort of global insurance scheme of the sort I've laid out in my book, um, where essentially countries could basically pay an insurance premium and be insured in terms of liquidity risks rather than have to build up their own insurance. So ultimately, if we were going to fix the situation, what we would need is what I think of as institutional reforms, both at the international level and at the domestic level to get away from the situation. But given the reality that we face right now, if we were to think about what is ideal, let's face it, if we were starting off with a blank slate, we would probably never design a system that looks like this with a small group of reserve currencies and one of them being dominant and not only allowing that country to run profligate policies, but some might argue even uh, essentially forcing that country um, to run profligate policies, although that's not necessarily a view uh, I ascribe to. But it certainly allowed the US to be much more profligate in its fiscal policies, in its consumer spending, and perhaps also given it much more leeway in its monetary policies. So we need to fix institutional um, aspects, both at the international and domestic levels. But given where we are, perhaps it's not such a bad thing to have one currency, one central bank that everybody in the world trusts and that one can uh, think about as a go-to uh, measure when the chips really are down. So the world for now 
is stuck in the dollar trap, but perhaps it could be a lot worse. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to participate in this panel. Uh, and Ishwar, it's a, it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it. It's, it's clear, it's informative. It's really a, a history of the economic debates that we've had uh, over the past few years since the crisis. And as I was saying to you earlier, it, it, it's nice having spent a lot of time in the last few years in, in the, uh, uh, the bunkers of, of the Treasury and elsewhere, dotting the I's and fighting over the commas to sort of find out what the big picture was that we were, that we were uh, all trying to, 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 to find our place in. Uh, so it's, it's really a very good book, and I, I hardly recommend it to, to you all to, to read. Um, also, I certainly agree with your, your main conclusion uh, that uh, the dollar is, is here to stay for, for the foreseeable future as, as the dominant reserve currency, um, despite what happened in the global financial crisis. Um, however, my, I think my take would be somewhat more, more positive than, than yours. I mean, you, you, the title of your book is The Dollar Trap. Uh, well, he wants to sell books. He wants to sell books. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, I, as, you were, as you were talking, you were leaning a little bit more to a, a more positive uh, view. Uh, and certainly it's a positive view that, that I would take. I mean, certainly the, the global financial crisis was a huge black mark. Uh, but on the other hand, the response to the crisis, uh, I think, was, was, was very aggressive uh, in the United States. And I think underpins... The, the trust that the uh, global investors have uh, in the dollar as a suitable uh, uh, location for investment and, and, and underpins the, the, the trust in, in the global financial system that is uh, centered on, on the dollar. Um, and you mentioned the Fed, and certainly the, the Fed uh, has played the prime role here, uh, not just in providing, uh, you know, a whole series of instruments to provide monetary support to the U.S. economy, but also, and this is a point you make in your book, uh, in, in, in preserving global liquidity at, at very difficult times by being prepared to provide backup liquidity support, uh, not just to its, its advanced economy partners, but also to a number of, of emerging economies. And also, you know, Washington did its job in a number of areas. Uh, it, Banks are recapitalized. Uh, bank regulations are, were rewritten. Uh, fiscal support was provided when fiscal support was needed. It was, it's been slowly with, withdrawn since then. Maybe the, we can certainly discuss the, the, the pace and, uh, at, at which the withdrawal took place. But at, at this point, the trajectory of US fiscal policy is, 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 is not profligate. Uh, we, the, there's very good reason to believe that the, the debt to GDP ratio is, is going to be stabilized in the next few years under current policies. You know, there's certainly a lot, a lot uh, more that could be done. I don't want to oversell my case. Um, you know, the US economy has, has long-term problems that need to be fixed, and the political process is certainly noisy and sometimes very scary. Uh, it's also disappointing, I have to say, uh, that Congress was unable to uh, provide, find a way to uh, fund the increase in the US contribution uh, to the IMF, uh, not able to put the, uh, the IMF quota increase in, in the recent omnibus legislation. And I think you know, steps like that do tend to undermine uh, the, uh, the confidence in that the US can play a responsible role uh, in the international uh, monetary system. Uh, but nevertheless, taking everything together, uh, I, would, I would still argue that the aftermath of the crisis has, has underpinned uh, the, the overall confidence uh, that the, the dollar provides a, a suitable anchor for the, the international financial system. Um, a couple of points that you, you make in your book, you, I think you have a nice discussion about currency wars. I think that's, that's, a, that's the topic that most, both Mr. Moreno and Mr. De Gregorio will, 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 be, will be interested in. Uh, you, you have a very neutral view on currency wars. You give, you give both sides of the story uh, very, very nicely. I, I would, however, clearly put myself on the, on the side of, of the Fed uh, in the sense that, yes, it's true in a narrow sense uh, that currency wars is a, is a zero-sum game, that one country's depreciation is another country's currency's appreciation. But I think if you look more broadly, uh, the actions that the Fed took to provide uh, monetary support to the U.S. Uh, prevented uh, 
a much deeper global recession than, than would have been the case otherwise. Um, and the, the Fed is, is, is clearly aware of its, its broader responsibilities. Now, to be sure, these steps, the successive sequences of, of quantitative easing and now the reversal does create uh, volatility in the market potentially and, and headaches for central bankers and policymakers in emerging economies. But I think the alternative would have been much worse. And there are instruments that, that countries can use. And countries that have had flexible exchange rates and quite well balanced monetary fiscal policies uh, and, and good regulations have, have generally been able to manage through quite well. I mean, Chile, I think, is a good example of a country that's, that has, has uh, worked through, through this with, with, uh, with, with, with good success. Um, but it's the countries that, whether it be issues in terms of unbalanced policies, too large fiscal deficits, or insistence on rigid exchange rates that have, that have had the biggest, biggest problems. In terms of your, your, uh, your liquidity ins insurance facility, I think that, that's an interesting idea. I, I'm kind of skeptical that it would actually work very well. Um, I think the main reason for the accumulation of reserves in recent years is, is not so much countries' desire to accumulate liquidity backstops. I think the countries have been happy to have liquidity backstops. But the real reason they're intervening was to prevent ap the appreciation of currencies and loss of competitiveness. And I don't think creating a liquidity backstop is going to change that motivation. I also doubt that the Fed would be prepared to participate in the, the sort of mechanism that, that you describe, uh, which doesn't give much room for discretion and judgment. I think the, the Fed will, will want to maintain uh, judgment about who its, who its counterparties are, are going to be. Um, looking ahead, I, I agree with you that the dollar is here to stay for the foreseeable future. I think over time, uh, as China becomes bigger, as it opens its uh, capital account, moves to more flexible exchange rate, as the Europeans uh, develop their institutions, I, I think we'll be shifting gradually towards possibly a more multipolar system. Uh, but I suspect that will be driven more by the market and less by policy design. Um, and w if we end up in this multipolar system, it's not clear to me that it's necessarily going to be a better system than the system that we have at this point. So we, we may look back in the future with some nostalgia at the time when we had a, a dollar uh, trap. Uh, thank you. Mr. Moreno? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. And it's uh, quite an honor to be here at Brookings and in the company of Charles and Jose Gregorio, who is uh, uh, a very distinguished central banker in Latin America. And uh, being a non-economist, I'm probably it, going to wing some ideas here, but uh, first I'd like to begin where, where Charles began. This is a really interesting book, and for a non-economist and somebody who wants to get kind of the lay of the land of what's happened uh, in these discussions that we've read uh, uh, in the last few years, it's a fascinating book, uh, and it's actually a very good read, and, and, and so many, many congratulations. I think we all, as David said, part of our role here is to help sell the book, so this is uh, why we're here. Um, one of the things that is very interesting, and it goes to Charles's point uh, on the whole question of the, of the currency wars and kind of the conflict that the U.S. Uh, had with respect to uh, countries that had current account uh, surpluses, uh, both on the ups and downs, uh, and, and the other issue which I think Charles also alluded to this whole idea of the multilateral oversight of global imbalances by the IMF. And I totally agree with, with what Charles was saying is how important it is. You know, I, I do believe that the fund, especially for countries that uh, are not systemic risks, plays a hugely important role. And having the fund recapitalize and moving forward in that reform agenda, uh, it's very critical uh, for a lot of countries. I think one of the great things that the Fed did during the crisis where really monetary policy uh, was at the center of everything was how quickly it was able to get uh, some of these uh, lines to countries that are systemically risky, like in our region, like was both the case of Mexico and Brazil. This immediately, not only what they did as well as what we did in, in, in development banks, helped mitigate uh, a lot of the, the effects. And also, I know Jose will, will build on this more, but the, he can give you a more insight. He recently wrote a, a book, which I recommend to all of you, of uh, 
why this time not only this crisis did not happen in Latin America, but more importantly, how Latin America managed it very successfully. That is something that we must always uh, remember. So uh, that's the first uh, uh, point I wanted to make. The other is something that, that the, uh, Professor uh, Prasad and Eswar ju just mentioned, which is the kind of like that great paradox that exists uh, of how, as he described it, here is the global financial crisis, the epicenter of the United States, and how the dollar become uh, stronger. And, and I think he has a pretty good analysis on, on, on kind of the unstable shortcomings and the, uh, and, the, and the equilibriums of the current international monetary system. And this is something that I think uh, will only be solved by a lot of work in the G20 and others. And, and I think you actually have some, some very good insights in, in, in the book. I, I do believe, as you were saying, that the dollar will continue to be a dominant currency. Uh, as you correctly say, I think more, more than anything else for a store of value, probably as straight uh, flows change uh, as units of account, as you have bitcoins and whatever other developments take place, probably that's going to change. And it's fascinating when I see it from my perspective at, at an institution like the IDB, how there's a tremendous interest of countries like China, but not only China, other countries like Brazil and others to begin to think of ways of trading across our own currencies. But that won't happen, as Charles was saying. I think this has a market-driven component, and that has to do a lot of how our trade flows begin to change. In, 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 in our region, I think a lot has to do with how value chains are composed, how we grow the, the trade integrations across the South. Uh, and that there is a lot to be done there. And I think that, at the end, will probably be uh, as, a, as a unit of account, kind of the changes um, that, that you will see in, uh, in, 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 the, in the, at least the dollar participation as we know it today. Um, but as you remind us, as where well, everything is relative. Uh, mostly for a lack of a better alternative, uh, I think we all agree that the fact remains that the financial assets that are denominated in US dollars, especially in US government securities, are still the preferred destination uh, for investors. You know, I, you go any, any uh, person who saves any money in Latin America for many, many years, and for that matter, in emerging markets, typically likes the dollar. And it, it's not changing very quickly. Um, uh, the, the other, the other uh, part that you talk about, the dollar trap, uh, is kind of that unstable character of the current equilibrium and the risk of the global economy. I think this is really the heart of the of, uh, of the discussions. And, and uh, uh, let me just uh, turn to uh, some of the things that you mentioned regarding the accumulations of reserves, because it's, it's fascinating when you look at the, the, the large numbers of how uh, even today 60 plus percent of, of the dollar denominated currencies are held by foreigners outside of the United States. Uh, and the reality is it's an insurance policy. Uh, and, and I think you cannot talk about the dollar and not relate something that you also relate in the book, which is the quality of U.S. institutions. And you know, at the end of the day, institutions are central to everything. They're central to development, but they're, certain, they, they, they're, they're fundamental for confidence. And, and I think this is the part of the, the breadth and depth of, of the U.S. financial system uh, that, can, that trades in the dollar. And, we're in a, and I think this is a, a, a very important consideration. Let me just give you as an example. Um, Latin America today has uh, international reserves that represent about 10% of GDP. This is the average of, of all the countries. That's, uh, a, of those, about 70% are invested in, in dollar-denominated financial assets. And that's the insurance policy which you were referring, which probably is, represents about half a percentage point uh, of GDP. And so the question to Charles is, is this a reasonable price? to pay as an, uh, as an insurance policy. And, uh, you know, that basically depends on, 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 on the damage uh, which you, would, you are protecting yourself against. Uh, and, you know, we saw in Latin America the sun stops. And, uh, and the risk of those sun stops, you know, in, in the historical terms, uh, they, they represent about two, two basis points of GDP. Uh, and the historical average is probably about 1%, 1.7, 1.8% 1 of GDP. So not to mention the, the direct correlation that would exist in terms of currency depreciation, which can be as high as 10%. So if you look at that, uh, you know, it makes sense 
uh, to pay that policy, you, just from, the, from, the, from that perspective. Um, in, in the, one of the other fascinating things Charles alluded to was this whole question of the, of the currency wars. Uh, because one of the outcomes of that, I remember a, a, a president of Colombia who is, was before a finance minister telling me, can you believe I had a dismission from the IMF and they're telling me all these controls I should put to prevent appreciation of the dollar, uh, or of our currency rather. Uh, so all of a sudden this set of tools came into being and they became, began uh, to be accepted basically to, to prevent uh, the, the rapid appreciation of, of, of the currencies. And now, of course, as we see the tapering, you see, of course, the other side of the equation of how quickly that tapering uh, goes, uh, the impacts on interest rates. Uh, and so this is very much a, a part of the discussion at the end. What really countries wanted was a closer coordination to understand and to be able to message the markets all in a unified way. So I, I think that's another part of the, of the international discussion that I think is missing, that is fundamental, uh, and I think we'll see much more of it. But again, I think it's a, it's a fascinating book, it's an easy read, and, uh, and I think we will be talking about this for many, many years to come because I think the dollar probably will, will remain to be a very important currency and, and unless you see government-driven kind of mechanisms, but, but I, I, I believe that mostly on, on trade-related matters is where you're going to start seeing the changes. But again, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Mr. De Gregorian, I, I hope, if, if not in your initial remarks, we can get to what you think about the capital controls that uh, Mr. Moreno refers to that the IMF seems now to consider uh, <laughs> a better idea than it used to consider. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, as a former governor of a central bank, and I'll be always a central banker, I have to recognize that and be very transparent. I was invited last night, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty bad for my ego. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I had the excuse to say that the organizers knew that I was around very recently. So that's, I won't ask them why they didn't. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it also has an advantage, because I, I, I didn't have time to read the book. <laughs> last, last night, I, I, wrote, I read the summary of the book. I have talked a lot to Eshwar about this idea, so I know, and, and, and I got excited with the discussion. You can still say it looks good. <laughs> yeah, but it looks very good. Yeah, I, I will read it on, on my way back, but it's... Um, so I don't have to refer exactly to the book, but I want to make three points, and, and, <coughs> and, and at the end, I, I'll talk about these controls. First, I want to talk about the importance of, of all this discussion about where the, the dollar, the euro is a threat, or the renminbi, which we have every, from several years, and, and there is sometimes a spike in research, and then, then a bit more on the issue of reserves and emerging markets demanding a lot of dollars. And, and finally, on currency wars, currency manipulations, currency suicide, and all of the things. So regarding the, and, and, and the, no, this I read on the book, it's, it's very nice how the book sets the issue about the dollar. They said it's a currency, and as a currency, it's a unit of account, it's a medium of exchange, and it's a store of value. Who cares about whether it is a unit of account? With a calculator today, we can choose different units of accounts and have it converted very easily. The same as a medium of exchange, we can even pick another medium, so, so it's not a big deal. There is always this old discussion that I always have been confused about in which currency are set prices. In general, prices are set relative prices. That's what we learn from economics. And, and then how you measure them is, is just a convention. But, it's a, so, but the important thing and, 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 and is, is that the, and, and what the, the, the book stresses is the, the US dollar as, a, as a, a store of value. Now, where this is important for emerging markets is for emerging market, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exogenous variable. Where we have to use the dollar, the remaining will depend on the world economy. I think the much more important is for the US, because the US collects senior edge from the rest of the world by issuing dollars, okay? And has also the US the exorbitant privilege, and, and everybody holds dollars and holds US securities, which is a, a actually brings a lot of benefits. Now, we in emerging market in Chile, we don't plan to have the peso as the, as the unit, as the store of value in the world, so, so we just take whatever it is. Now, now it's not that important. So then comes this second issue. It is a store of value. And most countries accumulate reserves in US dollars. For several reasons. First, it's not that 
that we demand US dollars, it's that you demand US government securities. And, and that's quite important. Why the first reason, I think that is the most unlikely country to default. So that's at, at the end from the point of view of, of, of default risk, I think that is usually taken as the, as the no default security. And second, it's a very good hedge. It is a very good hedge because precisely, as, as it was emphasized and, and, and in the discussion, when there is a turmoil in the world, the, the dollar strengthens, and it's, it's precisely when we hold dollars, okay? And when we worry about the, 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 the world economy, our economy's uh, currency is weakened, and it goes to adjustment. And from the wealth side, we are having the currency, the, 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 the security that help us to hedge against those bad states of the nature. And also, the dollar, and, and, and when there is a dollar de depreciation in the world, because there is some weakness, what tends to happen is that the real, the real, the relative price of commodities goes up. So again, at times of, uh, at times of a strong world economy, perhaps we have low relative prices, and, and, and that's why we demand dollars, and we prefer to have that hedge because the value of our asset will correlate negatively with the state of our, our business cycle. And now that's, we can do a lot of models and ask finance people to compute the, 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 the optimal thing. But also it has a huge liquidity premium. There is a tendency for very few currencies. And, and I think that at the end, when you have a one currency, it has a premium, that currency. And you want to hold that currency because you know that it's extremely liquid. And, you can, and, and, and that's quite important. I have to tell you that I, I, this is a, a, what we did in, in the Central Bank when, when we were calculating the optimal composition of reserves. And, and this is a, something that is public in the Central Bank of Chile. We basically hold peso, a, a dollars, euros, less euro, like a third euro, and, and, and it's almost half dollars, 30% euros maybe, or 40%, and 10% with a lot of other currencies. And we were getting rid of yen. That at the beginning you say yen, dollar, euro, but at the end, the, the, the yen doesn't help you to hedge too much your, your balance sheet at the central bank. So, so, the, so it's, it's a store of value. And then it comes to all this discussion, which is quite interesting. It's, it's a store of value in a moment in which countries are demanding a lot of reserves. So when emerging markets have accumulated so much reserve, there is a lot of pressures on buying US securities. Now, why countries accumulate reserve? And this is important for the future of the dollar. Why countries accumulate reserve? Countries accumulate reserves because two reasons. One is the insurance reason. And this is the typical reason we say, well, we have, want to have a lot of reserve because there may come a sudden stop. The other reason, and Charles uh, they put it as I think that uh, uh, timidly, and, and but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite important, is for competitiveness reason. This is a mercantilistic reason. Now, what is interesting is that commodity exporters, countries that had huge windfall gains, were the ones that most accumulated reserves in the world, which is an indication that reserves were accumulated because of competitiveness reason. And I can, we can tell a lot of stories, but I was sitting with many central bankers accumulating reserves, and you mentioned insurance, but you said, well, but your currency is very strong, so you want to accumulate reserves. So reserves are a way to intervene in the market and to have a, a and, and, to, and to avoid an extreme appreciation, which is fine, and I think that's fine. It's very sensitive policy. Whether it works or not, it's transitory effects are small, but this has been quite important, and this is important because the thing that's quite striking is that in emerging market, the, the, the use of reserves, the intervention during the global financial crisis, the worst crisis since the Great Depression, was less than during the Asian crisis. During the Asian crisis, there was much more fear of floating, there was much more concern about currencies weakening than during the global financial crisis. Average of 20%, which is still not that much, during the Asian crisis, you, many countries average 20% of reserve they use during the global financial crisis, 10%, and some few countries, some other countries, very little. So that shows that you have a lot of reserve, excessive reserves, and you don't want to use them because you have accumulated them to have, to attempt to have a weak currency. And, and that has worked. And then there are many issues about accumulation of reserve, but that also shows that 
Perhaps we may see if there is a turmoil, if tapering causes some turmoil in emerging market countries that, w that are not able to absorb a, a large depreciations, perhaps may have to start using some reserves. So that, that's a, and, and they have a lot. So, so we, may, we may see some, some reduction in reserves in some few countries, and especially some big countries that are, are not able or well prepared to, to accumulate reserves. To, 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 to absorb a large depreciation. Let me now mention and, and, and close with this discussion on currency wars, currency manipulation, IMF capital controls. This is, the world is kind of very schizophrenic. I don't know, I'm an economist, but, but this is. First, in emerging markets, at the beginning of last year, there was a talk about currency war and that the US was pumping dollars all around the world to weaken the currency. And this was uh, uh, very bad for us. And we have to fight this currency war. And then in May, in May, the US announced that they could start tapering, could start tapering, very gravel. And currencies move a lot. There was a lot of turmoil. And then emerging markets came and said, please stop. <laughs> we were Joking, no. We were talking about <laughs> currency true. war, but don't go to the other extreme. <laughs> so please, taper the tapering. On, on the other hand, we had Bretton Woods not so long ago. Then we had, and we have learned, we, we grew up studying whether you use the interest rate to do monetary policy, where you use money, where you use the chain rate. And, 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 and whether you want to do capital controls or some form of prudential things to avoid the precision and, and to, 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 because you cannot tolerate all the volatility. And then they call you a currency manipulator because you are doing things that are quite fine. Whether you can't, if you want to have an exchange rate ban, it's like having a, an interest rate. There is no religion to say that you have to choose the interest rate or you have to choose the chain rate. I, I like floating. I'm absolutely in favor of floating. And I think that capital controls are not that effective and we shouldn't rely or try to rely on capital controls. But this is a decision that sovereign countries make. It's not, so, so it's, it's not that we, we will impose a rule for the world. I think that's very bad to have a fixed exchange rate for emerging market. It's a huge mistake. But if they want to have it because they are not able to float, or if they want at least to have some, some smoothing of the currency fluctuations, that's fine. That's fine. It shouldn't be a big global concern. This is like, like Switzerland. The Swiss, they, they realize that this is, I, I, I like this story because we thought to do it in Chile. We did some quantitative easing, but the crisis was very short, so we started raising rates rapidly. But, but the, the, what, what, the, what the Swiss National Bank has been doing, they say, we will do QE, but instead of buying instead of buying a, 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 a T-bills and, and finance the US, we will buy euros, which is fine. It's, there's no difference between one security and the other security. And why? Because our objective will be not to push long rate to 1.5%, but to push the Swiss franc down. It's completely fine. It's completely fine. I think that it's a, the, the world economy, I think that the, what they need is to have a safe financial system, sound macroeconomic policies, low inflation, and growth. That's the best. And I said, when there was this currency war story, I said, the best for, the, for, the, for, for, for emerging markets is that the US start growing again. That's the best for their currencies, and that's the best for the world. And not how they exactly they do, because I think that what they're doing was fine. So, so I'm, I'm kind of... You know, we, we tend to, to blame too much the problems and our local problems on the foreign authorities rather than on our own problems. And I think that basically we have to, to deal with what the world is going on. The world needs an adjustment. The world, the world adjusted quite reasonable after the crisis. Emerging markets were the one that that, that, that grew at the beginning of the crisis because advanced economies did extremely bad. They did worse than Latin America in our worst time. It was a really a record how they, 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 they did pretty bad. 
And then now that, that emerging market has grown a lot, they may be close to now, now they have more long-term challenges. Now advanced economies, especially the US, are picking up. And that's, I think, that's perfect. And that's how the, the world, world should go. We need rules. This is not a world without rules. But they said rules are strong, good macro, free trade, and those basic things. And the rest, I think that we have to look at how we do our policies rather than to blame our neighbors. Thank you. Let me ask you, you used a term that Ashley Eshwar quotes you in the book, but I want you to explain what you mean. What is currency suicide? No. And who's practicing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we, we practice it. It's, a, it's, a, it's to sell. <laughs> but this, a, this, is, this, is what, it, this is sort of what's happening in Chile in the 90s. And, and, and it's my view in Brazil before the crisis, is when, when, we, have, when, when we claim low world interest rate eh, 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 and, and imbalances in the rest of the world for the strength of our currency. And we use capital controls, we intervene, but at the end, in those period, Chile and Brazil had two digit interest rate differential, almost 10, 12, percentage point interest rate differentials with the US. So if you don't have pressures in your currency when you are when you are when you have an interest rate differential of 10 percentage point, there is no way. So so that's it's not a currency war, it's closer to a currency suicide. Hmm. Uh, Charles, uh, Mr. Gregorio suggests basically that the whole concept of currency manipulation is wrong. That uh, countries should be able to set their own exchange rates. And if they want to base their monetary policy on an exchange rate target rather than an interest rate target, what business is it of the United States? So that's not exactly the way the Treasury has looked at it. What's the other side of that? I think it's, that's fine if you're a relatively small economy that doesn't have systemic consequences, and Chile would be in that category. Um, there are a number of other countries that have chosen uh, to peg their exchange rate or to intervene heavily in the exchange rate uh, where it does seem quite sensible, given the state of their uh, their financial system and their economic capacity, it's 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 hard to run a flexible exchange rate. However, uh, when an economy becomes large, uh, it becomes systemic, and a country like China is now the world's second largest economy, the world's largest exporter, and have an international monetary system in which. Most of the major economies floats, but one economy pegs the rate or heavily intervenes to, to manage the rate. It makes it, means that the exchange rate mechanism in the global economy no longer can play a useful uh, uh, buffering uh, role uh, to deal with external shocks uh, or to adjust to longer term shifts that are necessary. Um, so, I mean, I, for me, that in fact is is the, the biggest flaw in the current uh, international monetary system is, it, is you have this this asymmetry, um, and one of the consequences of that, for example, is that the global imbalances that were uh, present at the time of the global financial crisis and to some degree contributed to the crisis uh, have been reduced, but reduced in a very inefficient way, uh, basically by demand compression uh, by the deficit countries, uh, while the surplus countries like China and, and some others continued to, in, 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 in fact, uh, emphasize uh, the need for strong export performance. Uh, what would have been much better would have been if the Chinese had let the exchange rate move more, more quickly um, while taking actions to rotate demand within their own economy to boost domestic demand through consumption, um, raise China's uh, demand for, for global goods, um, and I think that would have meant that the, the aftermath of the crisis would have been uh, somewhat better. We wouldn't have gone through quite such a long period of, of slow growth uh, than we have, in fact, been faced with. I, I, I agree. That, that's a very important point, and I have to say that. For small countries, who cares? And that's the advantage of being small. So for big countries, there may be some spillovers. So but the issue is, would be that we have to really have a good sense of how large are these spillovers. And, and my impression is that what I have seen in the literature, they are not 
that, that big, the, the spillovers. Now, I would think this is the excuse because since I received the book last night, I can say whatever. And, and I said, well, I didn't thought. But this is a, perhaps a very extreme conceptual and perhaps silly comment. But who is the, big, the biggest currency manipulator in the world is Germany because they join a currency with very weak countries. And Germany, which they should have had the most appreciated currency today, they don't have it because they have pegged with Southern Europe. So where we draw the line? That's a, that's a where we draw the line? Is that, is that, but because Germany, they have a huge surplus. Right. And they have gained a lot of competitiveness because they chose 15 years ago to peg to very low productivity countries. And, um, well, you, you, make, you make a good point. I mean, there is a, there is a, a, a big issue with with German policies. It's hard to call it a currency manipulator since it's a member of a currency union yeah. that does not intervene in, in exchange markets. But as you say, it certainly benefits from the weakness of the euro, which reflects the behavior of the other countries rather than itself. It is an issue, and, and indeed, US Treasury has not hesitated to raise concerns about Germany's uh, continued reliance on exports and Germany's unwillingness to take steps to boost domestic demand. So it, it, is, a, it is a global problem. Uh, for these, these, these two large systemic current account surplus problem countries um, that requires different, different solutions, I think, in the, in the two countries. I think in China, it would be easier to deal with it through the exchange rate mechanism. In Germany, it, it's more to do with reforms. Eshwar, so let's talk a little bit about China. Um, put yourself in the position of the Chinese, and I know you talk to them quite a bit. How do they look at the world, and why do they think it's in their interest to have four trillion dollars of reserves, which seems to me, I don't know what the right insurance level is, but it's not four trillion. And what they want the RMB to be a reserve currency, they don't want it. What do they see as their interest, and do they have a clear way to get there? But China has about 3.6 trillion dollars worth of foreign exchange reserves, a lot of it held in the US. And this is clearly not ideal from China's point of view, because they are taking risks, and in fact, I do. Um, go over a lot of discussion in the book about how politically this is not working out well for the Chinese because domestically there are lots of pressures, lots of questions about whether this is going to end well. There is a nice expression from one of the Q&A posted on the website of the uh, administration that manages the currency. Uh, somebody asked, will the value of our reserves disappear like a cooked duck flying away? Which seemed like a very apt <laughs> metaphor apparently in China. Um, the Chinese... Um, I think are going beyond this uh, um, insurance strategy clearly, and it's largely driven by a mercantilist approach. Now, they're tied into this very difficult uh, situation where they are trying to rebalance the economy. And right now, the issue is not so much about uh, rebalancing away from exports as it is away from investment. Because in fact, the current account surplus in China has fallen from about 10% at its peak in 2007 to about 2% right now, although the trade deficit is beginning to go back up. So they're trying to do a lot domestically, and they don't want additional turmoil coming from what they see as an important nominal anchor, which is the currency. Now, simultaneously, they're trying to make the currency an international currency. And it's curious to be trying to, doing the, to do this when the currency is not convertible, when they don't have a flexible exchange rate. And China has always managed to move by its own playbook, and they're doing the same thing here. They are, in fact, selectively opening up the economy to both capital inflows and outflows and trying to get the RMB, the renminbi, to play a much more important role internationally. And the remarkable thing is how much traction this has got. Um, there are about six central banks that have already indicated, including the Chilean Central Bank, that they are or plan to hold a renminbi as part of their reserve portfolios. There are about 21 central banks that have signed uh, bilateral currency uh, swap lines with uh, the Chinese central bank. The renminbi is now um, the currency in which about 10% of China's trade is denominated, and China accounts for about 10 to 11% of world trade. So it's really getting traction. But again, my view is that this is not because uh, people believe that China is going to ultimately have the dominant um, reserve currency in the world, but because China is a big, large economy, the biggest contributor to world growth, and everybody wants to be friends with China. So it's a very low-cost bet uh, to become friends with China by signing currency swaps, by using renminbi, and thereby at least a little bit moving away from the dollar. 
Now, I think the Chinese strategy about capital account liberalization is really, uh, to some extent, domestically driven because if they can get the domestic uh, constituencies to sign on to this notion that a great currency should have, that a great country should have a great currency to match, it forces them to think about what they need to do domestically in order to make capital account liberalization work smoothly and to make it safe. And that, it turns out, is exactly the set of reforms that China needs. Better financial markets, better regulatory systems, and perhaps better institutions. So I think this notion of making the RMB an international currency may end up being a sort of Trojan horse strategy to achieve what needs to be accomplished domestically, but they still face some enormous challenges and risks. Mr. Rain, I wonder if you could look at uh, uh, the world from the point of view of Latin America, and is it, do Latin Americans in general, and I know it's hard to generalize, is it a good thing for Latin America that the US has a rival in China and maybe someday in Europe if they get to act together, would Latin America like to be less dependent on the dollar and on the U.S. markets, or does it frighten them because no one quite knows what game the Chinese are playing? Well, I think in the last 20 years, like the two big things that happened was China and cellular phones in terms of <laughs> impacting development in many of our countries. Um, China, I think, and, and Gregorio knows this much better because, for instance, about a third of the trade of, uh, of Chile is with Asia, and a good component of that is with China. Uh, the level of reserves that China has makes them a very attractive source of financing for Latin American countries. And you know we see it through, through the bank, but more importantly, this accumulation of, of reserves that took place in really almost in the last decade in Latin America was really part of the, of the super cycle of, of uh, commodities. So uh, is China a good force for Latin America? So far it has been. Uh, but I think, uh, and more and more, at least what we see in our discussions with the Chinese, they became shareholders of the IDB about five years ago, is they're very interested in finding ways uh, to do financing in renminbi. And, uh, and a lot of, th there's, you know, I think pretty much on this, uh, Chile has led the way in beginning to open up that, that uh, conversation. And, uh, and I think a lot will have to do with, with these straight flows that we see. Uh, they, they have been, you know, another store of value for, for China has been commodities. Uh, the huge amounts, I mean, in, in terms of what they've done, for instance, uh, through the Chinese Development Bank uh, on oil in some of the larger oil producing countries in Latin America is a, is a good example. They've been financing you know, close to $50 billion now, a bulk of it really going to, to Venezuela. So the short answer is, uh, it is not that you choose or not choose, it's China has been a good source of growth through a basically a commodity producing uh, region that we are. That's right. Let me ask you one final question before we turn to the audience for questions. Uh, you explained very nicely how we ended up in this somewhat uh, unusual equilibrium where everybody is forced to use the dollar as a store of value basically because they have no alternative. And because they want to accumulate reserves, there's nowhere else to do it. And we're kind of we're in the muddle through stage. But I'm curious what you think could go wrong here. If it doesn't make sense that the world is so dependent on dollars, what are the risks that something unpleasant happens and, direct, and disrupts it? What, is, this a, if, is this equilibrium a stable bad equilibrium or a fragile one? Okay, before I answer that, I just want to make one question clear. Um, as an academic, I should maintain my purity, so it's not good for me to say that I want to sell a product. I'm just trying to sell an idea. If you want to buy the book to get that idea, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> much better. <laughs> uh, but going back to your uh, question, so this is um, this was an interesting part of the evolution of my thinking as I wrote the book because it is useful if you want to appear sage-like to say that this is uh, all crazy and that um, uh, doom is nigh and that this is all going to end very badly. Then you can uh, get taken very seriously. But as I tried to work through scenarios where this. Um, uh, equilibrium, the fragile equilibrium as David characterized it would come apart, it turned out it was not easy to lay out a scenario. Uh, one could think, and I do have a chapter actually on tipping points. One tipping point could be China. So China holds a lot of US Treasury securities, 
but there could be political issues that cause China to say, I don't care about how much it costs, I'm going to take it out on these uh, Yankees. Um, but that scenario turns out to be very difficult to follow through to its logical quantitative conclusion. Let's say China says, OK, I want to take $100 billion out of Treasury securities. That would cause panic in uh, um, not just US, but international financial markets. But where is China going to go with that $100 billion? If you start looking around for markets where China could put $100 billion, it's really not there. In fact, the um, uh, sovereign wealth fund that China set up initially with a capitalization of about $200 billion, and that capitalization has risen to about uh, close to $500 billion. They're finding it very difficult to find good, high-quality investments. And even the sovereign wealth fund turns out to hold part of its portfolio in US Treasury securities and other US dollar assets. Things could go wrong in US bond markets. It's possible that um, uh, although inflationary expectations, despite all that the Fed has been doing, remain remarkably tame, but all of a sudden they could be panic. And it's very hard to predict what these t trigger events might be. But here is the remarkable thing, and if you think about panic, and what better example of the panic than during the financial crisis? In a time of panic, you want to put your money someplace safe. And as a small investor, if you have a few hundreds of thousand dollars or even a couple of billion dollars, you can move into alternative markets commodities. But once you start talking about the tens or a hundred of billions of dollars, it turns out that given the amount of liquidity that there is in US Treasury securities markets, there really is no alternative. So in a sense, this equilibrium, although it should be fragile by all logic, has sort of become self-reinforcing from the foundations because given where we are, we all have a very strong incentive not to allow things to crash. Now, it's true that the dollar is going to decline in value over time, but that, it turns out, is perfectly consistent with the dollar remaining the dominant store of value that everybody turns to. So again, it's a very curious sort of trap that we all walked into. And the additional paradox is that anytime the US does anything crazy with its monetary or fiscal policies, that's only going to tighten this trap. Um, but as Charles pointed out, there is a positive spin uh, too to this, um, that again, given where we are and given the possibility of instabilities, if we didn't have a currency and a central bank that everybody trusted in, perhaps it could be a lot worse. Okay, uh, we'll turn to questions now. As, if you want to buy Eswar's ideas, which happen to be encapsulated in a book. Uh, we're going to sell it outside, and Eswar is going to be signing things. Uh, there's a woman there. I asked two questions. First, uh, two favors. One, say who you are. Wait for the microphone, say who you are. And remember that a question generally ends with a question mark. And we have about 20 minutes and a lot of people, so please keep that in mind. Ma'am? Thank you, reporter from The Voice of America. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Collins and Mr. Moreno. Uh, if I didn't get you wrong, you two sort of think that China's political system is not a problem for China to become, Chinese renminbi to become a reserve currency. And that the Chinese government is now pushing hard to make the IMB to become a uh, international currency. So what is the biggest challenge for that? And my second question is about the US dollars. If everybody trusts US dollars, and is it possible that, because everybody trusts it, everybody has no, uh, no alternatives, so US, um, that would make US all the Fed to behave irresponsible. <laughs> And because when the, you, the Fed has this uh, loose monetary policy and everybody else, I mean, the China and other countries sort of start to uh, blame that to the, the U.S. is behaving irresponsible. So you'll be okay. okay. So Thank the first you. question, anybody can take it, is what, what would China have to do in its political institutions for it to make itself a real rival to the, to the dollar? I didn't refer to political institutions, right. and I would I answer am. the question more in terms of economic institutions. Right. But I mean, I guess Eshwar you can answer was, any question you want, even yeah. when I ask it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it, over time, the, the, as China has become the dominant player in global trade, the RMB will naturally become a, a an increasingly important uh, unit of account and medium of exchange. I think the real question is when will the RMB be trusted as a store of value? Uh, but the RMB cannot be a useful store of value until you have access to uh, RMB assets that yield good returns. And at this point, that is generally not the case. There's still heavy capital controls on flows into China. Those are slowly being dismantled, but the Chinese are being cautious. 
and they're being understandably cautious uh, because there are still big issues uh, in terms of the domestic financial system. I mean, Eshwar himself is, is, is an expert on this and talked a bit about this earlier. So the, the Chinese need to strengthen the regulation of the domestic financial system, liberalize the system, remove controls, build up uh, means to control risk in the system so that they are able to open up the capital account and allow uh, foreign money in and allow more competitive forces to operate. Uh, once that is done, then I think the RMB will become a more attractive store of value. And then you get into the political questions uh, about these. I mean, essentially, what we're talking about is, is the stability of the system un, under strain. Um, and there, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of relativities. And how, do, how does the Chinese political system look as, as a source of stability compared to, to other systems? Um, and that, I'm, I'm not an expert, but maybe, maybe others would like to take, take that one on. So Charles is correct that first, uh, uh, the first priority is to have a more convertible currency and uh, China should be able to provide high quality renminbi denominated assets that foreign investors can hold so that uh, it can be seen as a reserve currency that uh, investors have access to. Now, uh, even if China's currency does become a reserve currency, the question is whether it becomes a safe haven. And I argue that political institutions and legal framework are very important. I gave you an example already in my initial remarks about why Politics matters a lot because it gives uh, foreign investors as well the sense that things will not go completely out of whack. Now, um, this is not really a story about American exceptionalism, but the curious thing about the American political system is although it seems to be uh, cramped in political gridlock right now, it does have this tendency over time to correct itself. And I think this open democratic process does really help in that context. And the second issue is the legal framework. Now, you may not like the rules in the US, but the rules are applied in a fair and consistent manner. And it's very hard to think of many countries in the world where the government goes to court and very often the government loses. Um, and the government loses because there are rules that are laid out and the court interprets those rules, again, more or less fairly. So when international investors come into this environment, they know that, again, they may not like the rules, but they're going to be treated in a fair and consistent way. So I think this combination of a sound legal framework and trusted political institutions is really important if you're thinking of ascending not just to a reserve currency status, but to becoming an important safe haven. Mr. Gregoria, I think I got her second question, if I got it right, is isn't one consequence of the dollar's dominance that allows the US to run irresponsible fiscal policies and sometimes monetary policies? And isn't that a, a downside of the system? I'm, I'm thinking whether it's a yes or no it's question. Not a, it's not a responsible monetary policy. I think that's very, very fine. Sometimes you can take and push it a little bit. Irresponsible fiscal policy compared to many European countries is not very responsible. So, so <laughs> I wouldn't say. Of course, you have a benefit, but that benefit is and, and the response and, and, and the world will respond to the it, it, to, to your policies. If policies were really responsible and the U.S. going to a to a, to a solvency crisis, of course, you would get rid of uh, uh, U.S. securities, but that's not the case. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing country because I, I found very impressive in the, in the, they had all this fiscal contraction when the economy was coming out of a recession and they could have expanded, but they were looking at, with all the political mess, so I, I, I think that was a pretty uh, bad, but it's a, it's a, they were looking at that long-term solvency, which is a long-term stability. Uh, Ted Truman in the back there, and then after that, the gentleman in the back over there. Uh, thank you, Ted Truman of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. So my question is, well, what a little, well, so this question about the internationalization of the RMB, which fascinates everybody, let's be quite honest about that. Uh, it is a little weird because actually they're doing it backwards. Those usually you, act, you denominate your exports in your domestic currency, they denominate with the imports. That has something to do with monopsony, I think, rather than has to do with economics. Uh, uh, that's just common. So, but the question is, so why does a country now hold RMB in its reserves? You asserted, as far that Chile does. Jose didn't actually acknowledge that fact. <laughs> uh, he, he might or might not. I don't know whether it's a matter of public record or not. If it's not a matter of public record, I'm sure he will not acknowledge it. But the question is, uh, the question is, why do you do that when it is they're inconvertible, right? 
So in some sense, in some sense, you would only hold the reserves presumably when you have a promise from the Chinese authorities that you can use them, right? I mean, is that the right way to interpret this? And is that the right way to do that? And by the way, Mr. Collins used to be work for the National Monetary Fund. Strictly speaking, if you hold reserves in, in RMB, you shouldn't count them as part of your uh, as about your, as part as your reserves. I am confident that every country who holds RMB in the reserves counts as part of the reserves. Uh, they uh, holding inconvertible assets and various cats and dogs and furnitures and chairs and pictures and things like that uh, in your reserves is a long time uh, practice of central banks. Uh, but uh, so the real question is why? What is the incentive for Chile, if Chile is doing it, or any country to hold RMB in the reserves, given that presumably they're not they're not useful except when the Chinese say that they can use them. Very good and intriguing question, Ted. On Chile, it is a matter of public record. In fact, all the countries that are holding um, uh, renminbi in their reserve portfolios have stated this publicly, and they have agreements with uh, the Chinese government because they need to buy the bonds in the interbank market. So these are all a matter of record. The Austrian Central Bank, the Australian Central Bank have all indicated that they're holding renminbi. Now, why? The amounts are small. In Chile's case, it started out at 0.2% when Jose was the governor. It's gone up to about 1.8% again, a matter of public record. Um, and the question is, why uh, have a convertible currency and does this even count the reserves? Now, from the point of view of an emerging market, as Mr. Moreno pointed out, the key issue when you hold reserves is you want protection. You want protection against international investors who are going to threaten your currency, who are going to uh, threaten your balance of payments position. Now, I think about this again, I use this bazooka metaphor, which is used in a different context in the US. You have a big bazooka, and if you have a really big bazooka, you scare off investors. Who cares whether that bazooka is green or it's a little bit of red on top? Uh, and that's the way uh, central banks see it, because they have a lot of trade with China. And if you go back to the old notion of holding reserves, it was to give you protection against having import compression when your currency came under pressure. So if you're importing a lot from China, and China says, you hold some of my currency and I'll take care of you. That seems like a very worthwhile option. I think that the reason why many countries have uh, central bank swap arrangements with China, again, is the same reason. These are very small amounts, but being a friend of China, I think, is going to serve these countries very well in the future. And in fact, um, um, I didn't use this in the book, but there was one central bank governor who I asked uh, explicitly about this issue. And this was his response, that once we have a small arrangement with China, we can deal in a much more friendly basis with China. And it gives us a way of expanding this when the time arises and when the renminbi eventually becomes a real reserve currency. So I think at this stage, what we are seeing is a play by many central bankers, especially of countries that have very strong trade relations with China, trying to build better relationships with China. I don't think they see it as a safe haven currency yet. There's a question in the back there, the very back. John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development, an NGO. This may be petty cash in the realm in which you guys mostly operate, but I'll ask it anyway. Only in our professional lives. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what is the impact on the long-term credibility of the dollar in international realms when it's used, currency is used for domestic political reasons, uh, particularly when that political reason has no international support. And I'm speaking specifically of the way the US has tried to prevent Cuba from using dollars internationally and has fined European banks substantial amounts of money for daring to, to take Cuban dollars. Um, what is, what is, I mean, this is obviously, an immovable domestic problem at the moment, but the rest of the world thinks we're out of our minds. And so how, what is the impact of us using our power on the rest of the world? Charles? Um, I think it's a good question. Um, I, mean, I, I think the uh, implications of that particular example are, are, are pretty, pretty small, but uh, mm -hmm. You can imagine circumstances in which the U.S. could overplay its hand uh, in terms of exploiting its, its position as a reserve currency and using it for, for foreign policy reasons that could get countries nervous 
about continuing to hold uh, large reserves uh, in the U.S. Uh, so you know, I, I don't see it as a, as a, as a factor uh, in that particular example, but I can see scenarios in, in which that but would be Was it easier for the U.S. to use financial sanctions against Iran and Syria because they denying them access to the dollar-based financial system made them vulnerable, right? That's right. Right. But if you use that instrument repeatedly, then other countries that might think they're in the future going to go into the Iran and Syria situations right. may want to get out of the dollars before they get vulnerable to that sort right. of intervention. And that's why I would say that they'll leave as soon as they find somewhere else right. to so go. That's, that's why, it, in principle, it could eventually undermine the interest in countries in having the dollars. Uh, over here. Is there one on this side if you raise your hand so the mic can get close to you? Nicola Mather from the Embassy of Switzerland. Um, we've been hearing a lot about trust in the U.S. institutions, especially when it comes to the store of value function of the U.S. dollar. Now, in respect to what we've seen in uh, August 2011, last October 2013, um, isn't the market's behavior of not raising the yields of the treasuries, isn't, isn't that at least somewhat irrational to any of you? It's irrational if you believe that there are alternative financial investments that investors could turn to. But the key issue here is that uh, um, there is a, a paucity of uh, financial safe assets at this juncture. And when there is a prospect of further turmoil, investors naturally uh, turn to look for more safety. And this is the ultimate paradox at one level, that if there is a concern about the safety of the uh, US treasury, treasury securities, uh, people buy even more of that because they say, well, what else am I going to do? And I think this is where the trust comes in, because even if one might believe that things might go crazy in Congress and there might be a technical default, nobody really believes that ultimately the U.S. will not live up to its obligations. There are, in fact, a couple of uh, other, there's one other occasion in the past when the U.S. did actually go into technical default because, uh, again, Congress uh, um, uh, arrived at uh, a settlement only at the very last hour. This was, in fact, about uh, three decades ago. Uh, but there were no long, major long-lasting consequences from that because everybody understood it was a technical default. So this is where, ultimately, I think the trust comes, the belief that, number one, the U.S. will not walk away from its obligations. And it turns out statutorily that they cannot walk away from obligations selectively in any way. Uh, and second, I think the political system and the trust in the Fed is important for international investors and domestic ones to feel that the, uh, um, the government won't walk away from its obligations even in uh, um, real terms, that is through uh, a burst of inflation. And why isn't Europe more of a, a challenger? Let's say that after they get through the current crisis, they maybe build some new institutions, uh, unified banking system and stuff. They have some of the political institutions, and they have a tradition. Uh, this is very different than China. Why aren't they more of a threat now? You know, could be a threat, and in fact, it seemed like a viable threat. In the initial years after the establishment of the euro, the uh, share of the euro in world foreign currency reserves did rise from about 19% uh, um, uh, or so to nearly 27 28%. But then it stabilized, and in fact, it's fallen more recently. Uh, and the problem here is that if you take the um, extent of the um, financial markets and the amount of liquidity there, again, they don't quite match those of the U.S., if you add up the corporate bond markets and the government bond markets of the U.S., that capitalization is greater than the capitalization of all Eurozone bond markets, the bond markets of Japan, the U.K., and Switzerland combined. Um, so size plays a very important role as well. Uh, and I think there is a sense that, um, again, given that um, um, Europe is a union in some ways, but not really a political union, um, the fact that the ECB is very well trusted is still not enough for it to be underpinned as the major safe haven. But clearly, um, the euro with about 25% of uh, world reserves is uh, uh, a very trusted uh, safe haven currency. And Switzerland, with its institutions, again, um, uh, to your own detriment, has turned out to be uh, a country that uh, everybody trusts in as well. So uh, trust is um, not exactly a wonderful thing for the countries that are trusted. In some periods, it's good. In some periods, it can actually hurt domestic adjustment. Uh, here in the front. 
Uh, yeah, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News. I just wanted to follow up on the question about political pressure because it suddenly reminded me Eisenhower ended the 1956 Suez War by applying financial pressure directly on Britain and France to get out of Sinai. Is there, is there anything analogous to that now? Is the United States just doesn't have that kind of political power or is the financial situation now, the global financial situation so different? Or would there be, is there a possibility that if the United States felt like throwing its weight around that much, they would have the financial power to do so? I think in 1956, the, the US was still lending large amounts of money to, to the UK and France, which is uh, certainly not the case these days. The flows tend to go in the re reverse direction. Uh, and it's generally the case that the US economy is, is much less dominant in, in the global economy today than it was 20 to 30 years ago. Um, and that does certainly have consequences uh, for the potential for the US, to, as I was saying before, to, to use uh, 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 financial instruments for, for political and, and uh, foreign, foreign, uh, foreign affairs purposes. Uh, I think it's, it's very important, therefore, for, for the US uh, to, to use its soft power wisely and to, and to build alliances rather than to play a very unilateral role, uh, which is why instruments like the, the G20 and the IMF become, become very important, and it's why it's important to find ways to, to give them legitimacy and, and, and power, uh, because I think the US by itself is less able to, to influence the direction of, of other countries' policies than it used to be. I, I just want to add, I, I don't accept the premise that somehow it's wrong for the US to use its financial power for foreign policy goals if the alternative is we drop bombs on them. There is some, some, it may be the civilized form of warfare is to shut off their access to the global financial system. And it's not obvious to me that that's a bad alternative. Uh, uh, yes, here, and then Ashwar will get the closing words. I just wanted to ask you, you are. Uh, my name is Govind Mohan. I'm from the Embassy of India. Uh, what do you think uh, the implication of the premise which you've established in your book, which is the continuing supremacy of the dollar, is for an international uh, multilateral organization like the IMF. And I ask you this question in the context of the increased role that the Fed played in the aftermath of the crisis in providing easy liquidity to a lot of central banks around the world. You've made a reference to this in your book as well. Uh, do you think that there is a possibility that the role which uh, legitimately is assigned to the IMF, given the fact that it has lost a lot of its credibility, especially in the aftermath of uh, the quota reforms not being approved, even after three years, is likely to be, uh, let me say, usurped by a more dominant Fed, which has more credibility, and with the premise of dollar still being the strongest reserve currency in the world? This is um, an issue that's certainly reinforcing the current uh, um, very fragile equilibrium because uh, many emerging markets would like an alternative to the Fed, and the Fed did play a very important role during the financial crisis by providing large swap lines of credit to the big advanced economy central banks, which turned out to use it a lot, but to a very small and selective group of emerging market central banks as well. And as I document in the book, there are many central banks that did come to the US um, uh, and looked for support and they did not get it. Um, now, they would like to be able to turn to an institution like the IMF, but the IMF has enormous problems in terms of its governance and in terms of its credibility among emerging market economies. So from the point of view of emerging market economies, and this goes back to the point of reserve accumulation, they see one very powerful institution, the IMF, that they see as largely being in the hawk of the advanced economies. They see one very powerful institution, the Federal Reserve, that could bail them out, but they cannot count on it because there seem to be political considerations that play into this, and they cannot count on it at a time of crisis. So they are left to cope with this themselves. And that exactly reinforces this notion of having to protect themselves. And right now, even countries like India, after what we've been through in the last few months, uh, we're trying to build up reserves once again so that it won't have to come to this. 
And as any central banker, um, uh, uh, I'm sure, <laughs> including Jose, will tell you, it's not just the level of reserves, but the direction of change in reserves that matters a great deal. Once you start using up your reserves and markets test you, reserves can start disappearing very, very quickly. So during the worst of the financial crisis, not all emerging market countries used up their reserves. China, in fact, continued accumulating reserves. But of a group of about 14 um, countries that did use their reserves significantly, um, those 14 countries, including countries like Brazil, India, and Russia, they lost about a third of their reserves on average in a period of five to six months. And to a central banker seeing reserves disappearing that quickly, it is scary. So I think we are again back to the situation where um, the advanced economies are relying largely on monetary policy to get their economies out of where they are. Um, this is creating more turmoil in terms of international financial flows. This is causing the emerging markets to want more insurance. They have no place to go. They turn to the dollar. Do you want to um, give us some closing benediction here? <laughs> So, uh, like I said, this is not really a story about American um, exceptionalism. Um, um, and one of the curious aspects of what we are seeing right now is that the dollar, in its role as a um, safe haven currency, a reserve currency, is actually strengthening while U.S. economic and political influence around the world seems to be getting enervated to some extent. So, ultimately, this is a fault not just of... Um, the international monetary system, but the fact that there aren't other countries and institutions capable of picking up the slack. If Europe could get its act together, it could perhaps become, once again, a viable competitor. If China were to undertake the reforms it needs, both economically, but also much more broadly in terms of its institutions, it could become a viable competitor. But for now, we are stuck with the dollar. The book is for sale, but you have to buy it in dollars. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>